What do you think of when you think of money laundering? Do you think this is the thing that means I've got to get photocopies of clients' passports or I've got to check the identity of a client that I've had for years and years? Or do you think that you can disrupt terrorism, drug dealers or people traffickers? To us, preventing money laundering and ter terrorist financing is fundamentally about keeping us all safe and keeping the public safe. We've all seen reports of serious and organised crime. We can't fail to be shocked by terrorist attacks that happen across Europe and the rest of the world. And given the significance in moving money around the world, solicitors can play a part in preventing future serious crime and terrorist attacks. We can't think about money laundering as uh, a crime without any real uh, victims because the real victims are out there. It's about preventing modern slavery, people trafficking, prostitution, drugs in our communities. It's about the integrity of our economy and our society. It's about the rule of law. And that's why it's something that matters to the SRA and to you as solicitors and law firms. So it's particularly important that as a sector, we focus on preventing money laundering through the legal sector, through the law firms that you all run. You have to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Rather than being seen as helping cr criminals and terrorists move money around, hide, launder money, the regulated legal sector needs to maintain the public's trust and confidence by playing its part in keeping that public safe. We've begun to see newspaper headlines linking high street banks with money laundering and perhaps it's beginning to seep into the conscious of the public that they're all at it in the banks. We don't want that to be the case about lawyers too. And now's the time for us to take action to make sure that perception does not take hold. On the international stage, the UK, as Clive said, is about to have its anti-money laundering legislation and practices assessed by the Financial Action Task Force. That's an international body set up to prevent money laundering, uh, to improve standards uh, and, and, and to you know, work collaboratively across the world, across all economies, to reduce the amount of money laundering that goes on and learn good practice from other countries. It's high profile, it's important to the UK's future as an international centre of commerce. And it's particularly important at this stage because the FATF report will be published as their final report uh, towards the end of 2018, just as Brexit negotiations reach their crucial points. The legal sector took a reputational hit with the publication of the Panama Papers. That was the leak of 11.5 million files from the database of the world's fourth biggest offshore law firm and it exposed the ex exploitation of offshore tax regimes by lawyers for their clients. It would be good to think that no solicitors are facilitating money laundering and that it was a sector we were doing really well. But our thematic review and other evidence has suggested there are weaknesses in a number of areas. Last year, the SRA undertook 13 AML-specific investigations, issued seven letters of advice to refer five cases to law enforcement and six cases to the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal. We need to make sure that number goes down because this, this sort of practice has stopped and not goes up because of too much loose practice within our sector. It matters to the economy, it matters to the public, it matters to law enforcement, and it matters to the SRA. It has to matter to you and to your firms as well. But it's a time of change as well. Uh, most importantly, we've had the new money laundering regulations published earlier this year. Quite short notice with very little transitional periods. These new regulations impose requirements on firms uh, that fall within, within the scope of the regulations, but also on the SRA as a supervisor of anti-money laundering. The SRA indeed gets its own regulator, its own supervisor in the form of OBAS, the Office of Professional Body AML Supervision, which sits within FCA. You might have seen them and had the chance to speak to them up in the market stalls today. We've got new sanctions enforcement and the forthcoming visit from FATAF. And the good news is that the fifth money laundering directive is working its way through the European Commission, the European Parliament, uh, and there'll be more changes to come. This is an area where collaboratively governments and countries have decided there needs to be a greater focus and it's beholden on us to take that into account. We recognise there's been a lot of legislative change, but a lot of this is actually common sense. If you're taking a considered and reasoned approach to the preventing of money laundering now, you are probably on the right track, even with the new regulations in the future. But if you're not, now is the time to get your house in order, because the SRA is going to become more active in this area. 
We'll be writing out to firms shortly to gather information on which firms that we supervise fall within the scope of the money laundering regulations. It will be compulsory to respond to that. We'll be requesting the identity of various role holders that fall within the definitions of those regulations, officers, managers, beneficial owners, so that we can do the approvals that the legislation requires uh, under the, 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 the new regulations from earlier this year. We have a deadline of February 2018 to pass data to HMRC so that they can publish the register of trust or company service providers that the legislation requires because Parliament has decided that is right. But in the end, it's all about risk. So how do you as firms balance the requirements of the new regulations and the things you ask of your clients? How do we as a supervisor balance our responsibility to prevent money laundering with the regulatory burdens that we place on firms that in the end consumers pay for? The answer is we have to look at risk and respond appropriately and proportionately. How do we assess risk? Well, the UK's National Risk Assessment of Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing has been published. I'm sure you're already aware of it and reading it and will know that the legal sector is rated high risk. This shows that the government believes that your business is at high risk of facilitating money laundering and it expects you to act appropriately to mitigate that risk. In the new year, we'll publish our own risk assessment uh, to inform the work that happens across the legal sector. So learning from the national risk assessment, uh, working out what we think are the particular risks, uh, the particular flags that firms should be looking out for. You can expect some consistent and recurring themes around particular risks. Conveyancing, especially high value property, the use of offshore companies, cash buyers. Cross-border services, especially into or from high risk jurisdictions. Unexplained wealth to fund transactions. Small firms being targeted for big transactions. But there are things that you can do to protect yourself and the rest of us. Know your client. No, really, know your client, not get a copy of their passport, but understand them, where the money comes, what they're trying to do. Make sure that you really understand what they want and why they want it. Understand that money laundering risks that arise from the specific services that you offer, they are different in different parts of the legal market. Understand and use the suspicious activity reports regime. There's not enough of that at the moment. Think about how you handle client money and perhaps think about the opportunity to use third-party managed accounts to reduce some of the risks around that handling of client money. Read and think about the National Risk Assessment. Read and, risk, read and consider the SRA's risk assessment in due course as well. And make sure you read our thematic review of looking at firms that uh, we have considered over the last 18 months or so as well. And remember that you can call our ethics guidance service free of charge or use the web chat service from our website as well to get advice from our advisors on anti-money laundering issues as well. As I say, we'll publish our sector risk assessment in the new year and we expect all firms to read it, use it and to improve the sector's response to these risks. We are getting better at supervising money laundering and anti-money laundering issues. We expect you to be getting better at preventing money laundering. Now is the time for all of us to put our house in order. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So, um, session title here, Keeping Your Firm Safe. So, why am I here? So, I represent the National Crime Agency. A um, couple of basic facts. My organisation exists to lead the UK fight against serious and organised crime. Four and a half thousand people in it, officers in 50 countries worldwide, and focused very, very firmly on the top end of serious and organized crime. My role, despite the odd job title of prosperity, is to have lead responsibility for the UK law enforcement response to the threat from cyber crime and from economic crime. Within that economic crime space is money laundering. And of course, as already mentioned, money laundering as an issue affects virtually every form of serious criminality inside the UK um, and internationally. And when I say virtually every, it really is. So we are talking 
about serious crime, we're talking about terrorist financing, we're talking about the people who are involved in large-scale international corruption, the people who are doing drug trafficking, the people who are involved in child sexual exploitation and abuse. You, know, you wouldn't expect that to have a financial end to it, but it does. There is a commercial, uh, commercial and financial aspect to that problem in common with so many others. But within my area of responsibility sits the UK Financial Intelligence Unit, so the people to whom you are responsible for the submission of suspicious activity reports. Your role in protecting all of us from the problem of money laundering and terrorist financing. Now, Crispin's already mentioned the 2017 National Risk Assessment of the UK's risk from money laundering and terrorist financing. The overall scale of that threat is, frankly, huge. We are talking about hundreds of billions moving into and through the UK on an annual basis. A very large proportion of that money moves through the UK very quickly. Probably fractions of a second, frankly, but a significant amount stays here. A significant amount turns into UK property, finds its way into charities and foundations which are of value to those who have obtained illicit money and often have looked to move it out of difficult jurisdictions. Property is a fundamental issue for us, particularly high-value London property, but not exclusively. High-value property almost anywhere in the country is a potential issue from our perspective. Typical cases that we're seeing from large-scale money laundering, complex company structures, all designed to conceal the beneficial ownership of funds and of property, all of which require professional services and very often the professional services of a lawyer to actually create the structure and carry out the transactions. We're talking about huge issues in terms of value. Um, if, I, if I give one simple example, we went to court to seek restraint on a property two weeks ago that was a single property worth 10 million pounds in North London. We are doing that on a regular basis on high value property, but we're doing it on property linked to all forms of criminality across the UK. In almost all of those transactions, there will be the involvement of a legal professional. You are a, an absolutely critical source of knowledge, information, intelligence, on the way in which criminals seek to sequester, to hide their assets. Many of you are discharging that responsibility effectively all the time. But what is clear to us, unfortunately, is that that, is, that does not apply to every firm and every solicitor in the UK. Um, there's an even bigger issue when we look abroad. There was a mention already of the, um, of the Panama Papers issue. And far be it from me to, to do the BBC's trailing for them, but I note that they are trailing a Panama investigation, sorry, Panorama investigation on Sunday and Monday. Again, offshore assets and their links into the UK. We, um, certainly from my perspective, we're interested in seeing what that has to say. The National Risk Assessment, yeah, does specifically identify high risk in the legal profession. It's on the Treasury website, it's easy to find. There are four pages on, the, on legal services and where the risks lie. They are absolutely around trust and company formation and around conveyancing and then client account misuse. As I say, we absolutely accept that we have 14,000 legal firms, overwhelmingly people who are honest and who are trying to do the right thing. But what is, is clear and is clear from current investigations is that we do have a very, very small number who are criminally complicit. We do have some who are careless and some who are just unclear, unsure about their responsibilities. 
Suspicious activity reporting, 420,000 SARs came into the UK Financial Intelligence Unit in the last year. 86% of those came in from banks and building societies. 3,500 came in from solicitors, a drop of 10% on the previous year. And half of the ones that came from solicitors were in relation to the property market. We get some very good, very straightforward examples of SARs that come in high quality from the legal profession. And just to give you two very quick examples. So a solicitor's firm reported to us seeking a defence against money laundering to proceed with the purchase of a property. The reporting firm, acting on behalf of the buyer, was confirmed that the property might have been purchased with the proceeds of crime, having identified the current owner had been convicted previously for drug trafficking. That property sale was allowed to go ahead to make sure that there was no unnecessary impact on the innocent parties, but law enforcement did pick up the issue, did restrain the value of the property, um, and that value is being now included in criminal confiscation. Equally, another solicitor's firm sought a defence against money laundering in a suspicious activity report to complete the sale of a property and transfer the sale proceeds to a client's relative. Again, the legal firm had become aware that their client had received a prison sentence for drug offences. They were therefore concerned the funds were being sent to a relative to avoid potential confiscation proceedings. We refused the request for a defence against money laundering and £120,000 are restrained. Good quality, very valuable suspicious activity reports that came into us with clear information. You know, why are you concerned? Who is it you're concerned about? What's the transaction involved? What's the property? Unfortunately, that doesn't happen all the time. If I look at a significant number of the good quality reports that we get from the banking sector, we see an interesting, an interesting issue. In very simple terms, we see the banks identifying to us high value transactions where they have suspicion about those involved and the source of the funds. So we see property transactions, again, often high value property, reported to us by the banks. There are legal professionals, usually at both ends of those property transactions, and we are not seeing the reporting from the legal professionals. And yet, these are cases where we are able to investigate, where we're able to restrain the funds, um, and yet we see a situation where those who are closest to the customer, closest to the people involved in the transaction, who have the closest relationship in know your customer terms, are not reporting to us. Something in that instance is not working effectively. What is clear from some of the feedback and some of the reporting we get from the legal profession. And I emphasize, you know, and I've already given a couple of examples, we get some really good quality reporting from the legal profession. But we also get reporting that focuses very, very closely on the identity, but not at all on the sources of funds. So one half of the know your customer in due diligence work. I think there is a real issue about the extent to which everyone with a responsibility in the legal profession really understands the value and the rationale behind what you're being asked to do. It is absolutely the case that, that you are very likely to be the people who will see high-risk transactions in a way in which no other part of the financial sector or law enforcement will be able to do so. If you're reporting, we have a much clearer picture. We have a much clearer picture of how the problem manifests itself and where we can go to recover assets, where we can go to frustrate criminality, where we can go to deprive them of profit. And it's worth noting that, the, that this issue extends further with the Criminal Finances Act, um, which has now come in as the CFA 2017, but where we have provisions due to be commenced, some today um, and others 
at the moment due in January. So unexplained wealth orders. The fact that we will be able to seek an unexplained wealth order requiring people to demonstrate where they sourced legitimately the funds to acquire property of all forms in the UK if we believe there is a problem. I have a whole series of cases already backed up, ready to be used for unexplained wealth orders. There is significant SAR reporting behind that, as well as some significant investigation. Some of that comes from the legal profession. We expect to see more. We expect also to see more take up of cases by law enforcement that are reported in of all values where we're looking at suspicious activity reports requesting a defence against money laundering. Because there is a provision in the Criminal Finances Act that means that we can now extend the period where law enforcement has time to investigate and to get in front of a court for a restraint order. That's hugely valuable from a law enforcement perspective. It's hugely valuable from a public protection, public value perspective as well. I think the key message that I would, I would leave you with is the one I've given you twice already, which is you are absolutely at the front line of the detection mechanism for significant money laundering. It doesn't matter whether that significant money laundering is linked to drug trafficking and drug supply in a local area anywhere in the country, or whether it is linked directly to large-scale international corruption, whether it is linked to other forms of criminality. If you report to us, you are helping keep A, the UK and the people in the UK safer, and you are helping protect the reputation for integrity of the UK as a safe place to do legal business. I think that's a hugely important role. Yes, often it feels like a burden. I know it feels like a burden. But there is a value here, and it's a legitimate value, and I think a legitimate expectation that government has of, of you as a profession. Some of you, many, many of you, are discharging that obligation very well. I just wish that was the case right across the board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I am going to speak to you a bit about financial sanctions and hopefully you'll come across there are quite a few common themes and issues with the ones that Crispin and Donald have already raised. But I want to just start by saying a bit about what financial sanctions are and why they matter and then to go on to speak a bit about compliance. So financial sanctions play a very important part in the UK's foreign policy and national, pol and, and national security objectives, but they're also important in trying to maintain the integrity of the UK's financial services and maintaining confidence in the UK's financial services market. And it was largely those objectives that led to the creation of OFSI back in March 2016, where we were charged with really making sure that we could improve awareness of financial sanctions, but also to detect and address breaches of financial sanctions more effectively. And at the heart of the objectives that ministers had in mind at the time was ensuring that we could provide a better quality of service to the private sector in doing that. So, we implement currently around 34 sanctions regimes with approximately 2,000 individuals and organisations who are subject to sanctions across those, those 34 regimes. And the majority of those regulations we implement, they come through the UN and the EU, but we also implement some UK-only sanctions. So what are they? Well, an individual or organisation who's subject to sanctions, we generally refer to as a designated person, but financial sanctions cover dealing with their funds or economic resources, so any which are either held, owned or controlled by a designated person will often be subject to those sanctions. 
and it covers both the sort of dealing with their funds but also making funds or economic resources available to them either directly or indirectly which is where some of the messages that have already come through around knowing your customers becomes very, very relevant. So this tends to involve transferring funds um, either to or from a designated person or to someone who's maybe working on behalf of a designated person. And that sort of activity is prohibited in the absence of a license from, from OFSI. And if you want to understand and get a better understanding in sort of real time about the details of the individuals who is and isn't subject to sanctions, that's all available on OFSI's um, website where through gov.uk we make available a list of all of the financial sanctions targets which is updated, updated regularly and it's really important to consult that list if you think you might be dealing with a designated person and to use some of the information that we make available through that, that list to really help you as part of your know your customer checks. So financial sanctions tend to be in place for a variety of, of reasons and each regime is different. So whether it's at one end of the spectrum where sort of the Egypt regimes, for example, where we've, where sort of, um, which freezes funds which are believed to have been stolen from the Egyptian state, where the objective, the policy objective is really about, ma about maintaining those assets that they can one day be returned to, to the Egyptian people or indeed the sort of Syria regime, which many are sort of most familiar around, which is about punishing those who are responsible for some of the violent oppression, repression of the civilian population in Syria. So when you look at some of the reasons, the range of reasons, and there are obviously many which are about counter-terrorism um, or sort of uh, trying to address sort of a nuclear proliferation, you know, the reasons behind this, it's quite easy to see the sort of real world impact of compliance or indeed of non-compliance with, with financial sanctions. And that's why sort of last, in April this year, there were new powers that were introduced to really make sure that we could address serious breaches of financial sanctions more effectively. And the Policing of Crime Act 2017 gave us the power to impose civil monetary penalties that would be either up to a million pounds or 50% of the value of the breach, whichever is greatest. And that's in particular focused around sort of the most serious breaches of financial sanctions that occur. And we've published guidance around how, how we will use those penalties, when we will determine that it's appropriate to use those penalties, but also um, how we will determine the value of the appropriate penalty. But the Act also brought into um, effect some additional powers which will, for in the sort of criminal space, um, because ultimately breaching financial sanctions is a criminal, is a criminal offence, and that increased the maximum prison sentence to, to seven, seven years. Most non-compliance cases you know, tend not to be at the most serious end of the spectrum and we will always seek, we have been seeking to work with, with firms and individuals who have not complied to really focus on how you can improve your, your due diligence and prevent further breaches and we will continue to do that, to do that going forward. It's worth noting just in relation to your responsibilities that in August this year, the government also widens the scope of businesses who could face criminal prosecutions for failing to report breaches. And people in this regard often focus on or assume this is all about financial services. It's just something that the banks need to really concern themselves. But what that did was that under EU law, all businesses are required to, to report. And previously, those had been sort of really focused around financial institutions who could face criminal prosecutions for non, not reporting, but that has been expanded and includes the legal, the legal sector and other professions to really help to make sure that we can improve the, um, the sort of compliance with, with financial sanctions across the EU. So you are required to report 
non-compliance to, to OFSI. If, if you believe that, that someone is subject to, to sanctions, has either committed an offence under the regulations, or if you suspect that, that sort of either you or others have breached financial sanctions or are circumventing or seeking to circumvent financial sanctions to report that to us. And we have been engaging with firms where they have been seeing, where they sort of suspect that something is about to happen. And they've liaised with us to really prevent that breach from occurring. And that sort of interaction is very welcome from our perspective as well. So I spoke about sort of making sure that that information is more widely available and we will continue to try and update the guidance that we provide to make it easier to understand what it means to comply. But it really is to, you know, it really falls to you to assess your own risks, to understand not just your customers, but to understand their activities and therefore where you think there is particular exposure that means that, they're, that financial sanctions are relevant. And whilst we provide that sort of general information and guidance, we recommend that businesses really seek independent legal advice to if they if they need if they're dealing with more complex cases and to really assess their their own risk there are circumstances so although these sorts of transactions either sort of where it's making funds available to a designated person or receiving them from from one or those though those are sort of prohibited under the law there are circumstances in which OFSI can issue licenses in order to lift those or sort of in, in certain circumstances to permit the, the sort of activity that would otherwise have been unlawful. And there are six types of, of licenses or sort of reasons, derogations, reasons that we can use to, to issue licenses. The most common ones that, that come up in your, in your sector are to the, for the sort of reasonable professional legal fees which is understandably common in, um, in your space, but also where there are prior contracts in place where sort of before those sanctions were imposed, you entered into uh, a perfectly legitimate contract with someone who then subsequently became, became um, subject to, to, to sanctions. And the third is to cover the payment of fees for, for routine holding or maintenance of, of frozen assets, which is again one that sort of pops up quite a lot in your sector. The others are, are detailed in our, in our guidance, which is available online. But in order for a license to, to be granted, the, the transaction must really fit with one of those exemptions that we can, we can use. And it's up to you to really inform us of the sort of detailed nature of the activity and also to tell us which of those exemptions you think applies um, for your license. There's no guarantee that we can grant licenses, but we will often, we sort of seek to engage with you and encourage you to really contact us at least four weeks before that transaction, before that transaction needs to, to take place because we need to do the necessary due diligence, make sure we understand the, the activities um, that, that you're seeking to, uh, to, to undertake. And it takes time to go through that sort of, um, that sort of process. But you must have a license. If financial sanctions do bite, you must have a license from, from, from OFSI before that transaction takes place. So finally, what I wanted to just really touch on with you, and I suppose that's, this, is, this sort of under, explains the reason why I'm here today, is that you know, despite the sort of increasing um, coverage around sanctions and the extent to which it, it, there are particularly live issues around both the in, in changes in sanctions in relation to North Korea or the future direction of sanctions on, on Russia um, and others. Actually, it's, it always surprises me just how variable the sort of knowledge and understanding is about financial sector, about financial sanctions in the companies who are most affected by it. 
And that's why we have really focused on sort of improving the engagement, making sure that we spend more time trying to engage with companies to make sure that they understand some of the, their legal obligations and working with particular sectors, including the, the legal sector, to really address some of the specific issues that come up and arise from them. And in that regard, I'm very pleased that we'll, we're, we're sort of working with the SRA at the moment to de develop some some, some um, guidance that's really tailored towards your sector and picking up on some of the frequently asked questions that uh, arise and we will hope to be publishing some further information on that in the in the in the new year but very keen to to continue to hear from you we've been working with you around some of the very specific issues that have been arising the changes that um, that we can anticipate in in the legislation but the feedback that we get on the guidance what more it would be helpful for you to have so that you can better manage your risks and improve your compliance that's really the kind of information that it's important for us to continue to get from you so that we can improve the quality of the service that, that, we, are, that we are providing. So thank you very much for having me today and I look forward to the, the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much indeed. Keen to get questions from the audience. Just a few quick ones from me, first of all, um, and asking for relatively speedy answers, if, if I may. Um, are, are we, in terms of you know, Parliament, uh, law enforcement, are we getting it right when it comes to effective measures to tackle money laundering on the one hand while not overloading firms with bureaucracy on the other? Donald, perhaps you first. I don't think we're far away from having it right. I think the issue of bureaucracy is an interesting one. I think bureaucracy is, is more what you make it. Um, it's back to this point that says you, you need to be confident that you understand what your customer is looking for, that you understand where the funds have come from. The level of bureaucracy required to go into that you know, is, is variable. It's really a matter of making sure you do actually understand and identify risk. And, and ultimately, that is a decision which only the firm can make. Do you really understand that? Now, there is a downside. There is a downside because failure to report is an offence under Section 330 of the Proceeds of Crime Act. I, I confess I thought quite hard about the, the tone to take in this, in this conference. I could have come in here and said, if you are involved in conveyancing high value property, if you are involved in the creation of complex company structures, and you, know, you are not thinking really hard about risk, you're not thinking really hard about whether, you know, whether this is legitimate activity, is there a basis for this other than seeking to conceal for tax fraud, for criminal reasons, beneficial ownership, why aren't you reporting? But actually, you know, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a real issue here, which is about it's important that, that professionals across the reporting sector, regulated sector, not just in the legal profession, understand you know, the, the positive side of the role. Not that it's a burden, not that it's always a threat, though for some it is. Okay, just a quick show of hands. Who here thinks that the burden is too heavy, there is too much bureaucracy, there's too much, uh, in, in, just one person so far. Okay, yeah. that's interesting, I thought it might be a, a few more. Okay, <coughs> someone waving from the back there. Um, <laughs> okay, but uh, Rena, what do you think? Do you think the balance is about right? So I think look, there is always more that we can we can do to address this, and I'm always very conscious of the the sort of costs around that of compliance and and where those and where those fall, and in particular, I think what we can do is make sure that there is much clearer information out there about what is re what is required and what it what it means to to comply. And in in my world, you know, I sort of work as much as we I, I sort of touched 
touched on the sort of civil civil enforcement sort of angle a bit earlier but as much you know I see this as partly you know in, in other aspects we are working in partnership we are all have that with some of that responsibility around implementing financial sanctions and in that regard I think we can work together to continue to think about how we how we do that most effectively how we make sure that we do we are identifying the assets that that need to be frozen but the, the alternatives are quite are quite extreme, and I think that's the bit that, that probably we we do need to have a bit of um, uh, an honest conversation about, actually. Which is, if you, if you know, if you don't have these sorts of financial sanctions in place, if you don't have the anti anti money laundering um, regulations in place, then there are consequences um, and um, and costs not just at a sort of national level from a, from a government or public uh, sector perspective, but also for businesses. This is about making sure that those uh, that everybody is is compliant with the law. Okay. Uh, one word answer from, from both of you on, on this one, please. And Don, I know you mentioned banks and building societies uh, reporting um, you know, in, in larger numbers, but do you think that the legal sector is ahead or behind the curve when it comes to other sectors <laughs> in playing its part in preventing financial crime? Behind. Behind. Okay, Rena? Be honest. <laughs> so... I would pro I, I'm struggling with the comparison because right. that's not the way that it works for from our perspective but it's not where I would expect it to be oh, so, so. okay could do that yeah okay Crispin uh, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps ahead of other legal jurisdictions around the world but not as good as it could be and behind other sectors in the UK okay all right let's go to the floor let's have some questions from the floor uh, the lady sitting down here can get a microphone too. Hi, I'm Claire Jacob from RPC. Uh, my question is for Rena. Um, we're currently doing a risk assessment when it comes to anti-money laundering, and we're finding it relatively easy when drafting our questions as to what the kind of high-risk factors will be, whether it's related to the transaction or to the client. We're much more struggling when it comes to financial sanctions. So do you have any words of advice as to what, how we can tease out from our partners what might be risk areas for us? So I think it is, if, those, if the sort of basics are in place, which they need to be across sort of um, the, in order to comply on the anti-money laundering, then doing some of those basic checks about whether, whether financial sanctions bite. So the individual or, or company or organisation that you're dealing with, are they on the consolidated list that's published? The second one, which is, which is always sort of definitely for me in this area is quite striking, is particularly having an awareness of the jurisdictions that you are, that, that you are, that you are dealing with or that your customers are, are passing through. And I think it is always a bit of a surprise that, that um, in some, when I see in some instances that a sort of light bulb hasn't come on at some point that says if you are doing business that sort of involves um, Iran, for example, or sort of Syria in one way or another, that's when it isn't actually sort of stopping and thinking what what does that mean for the sort of um, the financial sanctions uh, legislation that I need to comply with and some of that I would hope should come through sort of the you know through the sort of um, awareness of just the what's going on in the news but then there is something about then just going back and doing that check because I do appreciate that it's not always immediately obvious sort of which which jurisdictions um, which jurisdictions either the money or services are flowing through about where the transaction is based or where the client is based. Because I, 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 I hear stories about, well, it could be a UK citizen who's subject to... It state. absolutely could be. But this is where we're, where we're struggling. And that's why I started by saying check the list so you know the name of the person that you're dealing with and this is one you know we do receive this is one of the areas we do receive calls from 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 companies within your sector about which is you know there are some very common names that will naturally appear on those on on those lists and doing those checks and trying to identify whether the person that you're that you're dealing with is likely to be the person who is listed on there and we can always provide you know we take calls and and provide 
are and to help people to to navigate their way through that um, and to to sort of deal with what we describe as sort of false negatives where you might have a name match but actually very different ages different passport sort of details etc but I think starting with that basic check of is the person or company that you are dealing with listed and often that doesn't happen and that should be the first of the triggers okay i, th I think i think we're going to have to uh, do you mind because we, i know there are lots of other people other questions gentlemen sitting in the middle there with his hand up uh, can we get a microphone to him Thank you. Um, Nick Elam, Sydney Mitchell. Um, question really for Crispin. Can you give us any definitive guidance on passing on the cost of compliance to our clients? I read uh, ethics guidance probably 18 months, two years ago now that suggested that it was an overhead of the firm, it was the firm's compliance obligation, and it couldn't be passed on. But where do you draw the line? How, how far into source of funds inquiries, into actually making into carrying out our own investigation and giving good quality information by way of an SAR, how, how far do we, how far is our obligation? Um, yeah, you could have your, your own pricing model and it's a competitive market or, or hopefully a competitive market and, and you've got to agree those prices with your customers. Um, you mustn't mislead them. Um, I think it would be a bit odd if you had a, a separate line saying getting advice on how to advise you. Um, but yeah, these are the costs of running your business and the costs of running your business will inform the price. Uh, I don't think it's for us to decide how you do that. Really don't. Okay. Um, I'm, I really don't want to ignore the back of the room either, but it's quite difficult to see if there are hands up. So there's one uh, just by the alley. Uh, we've got one. Yeah, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a bit concerned. I'm, it's Harry Cotton, Cosmos Solicitors. I'm just a bit concerned that uh, the authorities are... It seems to be very keen on using professional people who are providing a service to the clients as effectively fraud police. I mean, obviously, we're, we're all aware that we have these obligations and we comply with them, most of us comply with them. But aren't there more intelligent ways of combating this by using the land registry, for instance, when perhaps the land registry should be asking um, solicitors that are submitting high value transaction cases to them, you know. Where, where are the sources of the funds coming from? Perhaps that, that will place the solicitors in a less difficult position than they are in the moment. Okay, good point. Are you outsourcing uh, you know, law enforcement to, you know, or excessively, or too much to solicitors, practitioners? No, I don't think we are. Um, we use land registry data all the time. That's absolutely true. Um, but we're still in that. It comes down to that absolutely some point. The, the solicitor involved in the transaction is the person who is best placed to know the client to really understand the client. They have to have a relationship. They are the ones who are in the position to really understand what is going on. Um, and there are two ways to look at that. One is either you're taking on a responsibility which is helping to protect society. Um, the other, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, is if you don't want to discharge that responsibility, then actually you're benefiting from criminality. Can, can I can yep. contribute to that? I think it's a legitimate question, um, and these are hard things to, to balance, but I guess I look at it and say, you know, you get the title solicitor, you get a monopoly on the use of that word that other people mm. can't. There aren't many titles like that. Doctor's not a protected title, for example. Uh, you get to operate in the market and it's still the most powerful brand in, in, in the legal yeah. market solicitor. With that comes some responsibilities, yeah. and those responsibilities evolve over time depending on mm -hmm. the nature of our society and the nature of challenges that our society faces. This is a new one. I suspect it's still contested for us to find out exactly what the public expects in return for you having that title solicitor. So I think it's legitimate to ask it, but I think it's right equally that, that this is part of being a lawyer, uh, this is part of supporting the rule of law. Okay. Let's, let's take another, another question, if we... Uh, okay, um, I'm, I'm really conscious of not uh, ignoring the back of the room, but one let's, in the middle. let's go for the one in the middle. <laughs> yeah. I don't do property transactions myself, but um, I'm interested to hear that I'm in the front line in this money laundering uh, uh, business. Uh, I've gone or two, and I don't know where you're based, uh, Whitehall or Scotland Yard. Um, if, if we are supposed to be dealing with these uh, gangsters, drug smugglers, people smugglers. Um, what, what advice should I pass on to colleagues who are dealing with these sort of people? 
um, for their personal safety, the safety of their property, their staff. Uh, just do it on a Thursday afternoon when the PCSO happens to be on duty or what. Okay. Uh, Rena, do you want to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, we haven't we haven't swapped badges. I mean, I think the no. um, but, no, but sorry, I mean, Tom. the same thing. I mean, if you say if you identify that sanctions are being broken, you know, it, 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 sanctions that are imposed on a dangerous individual, yeah. and you're the person who's calling them out, then you're putting yourself in in the line of danger. So that information comes through to us or through mm. the the NCA in in, in 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 many instances, and is held confidentially. Um, as you would expect, I mean, we don't. I mean, we don't then. There will. We don't then go around sort of publicising that you know someone from this particular okay. law firm has contacted us to inform us that um, uh, that that they've broken the law or that they're suspected of breaking the law. So we have a duty. Of, that's absolutely clear. So so we have a duty of confidentiality on the content of SARS, on the content on where they come from. Um, we don't broadcast it. It's used in court. Um, we're not. We're not asking. For you to do anything other than report where you have a suspicion. We're not asking people to go out and tackle gangsters. We're asking you to discharge a professional responsibility and to report where you have an identified suspicion. We are not going to then go and tell everybody that the only reason we know about this is because this individual solicitor in this firm, by the way, at this address, told us about it. Uh, but have you had situations where the solicitor who has contacted you, who has um, you know, raised, raised the red flag, has been put in danger? And, and what steps are taken to protect I, I cannot, I cannot think of any instance where we have had that happen. And indeed, we have been in a position where we have not taken action in court because we felt we could not protect the contents of a suspicious activity report. All right, next uh, question. Um, this gentleman, we'll take the gentleman down at the front and then I think there was someone... This is one in the middle. Hello, Groundwood, you wrote the law. Really connected to the last two questions. Um, the solicitor-client relationship is a fiduciary relationship. It mm. generates an obligation of trust and confidence. And if solicitors are overzealous in reporting suspicious transactions, um, is there a danger that the confidence which clients should have in their firms and their solicitors may be eroded to some extent? Maybe Mr. Tudor? Yeah, Crispin, why don't you So there must be a risk. Uh, I think criminals will be less confident in using solicitors, um, but I think the rest of the public might be more confident. Um, it, yeah, OK. Uh, we had a lady in the middle, I, I believe, yeah. Yes, hello. Um, I'm Karen Bauer, Brown, Sills and Batteridge in the East Midlands. Um, we um, had a situation where we made a suspicious activity report, and our obviously we weren't able to tell the client we'd done that, and the transaction couldn't proceed until we had permission or until the time limit had expired. And that um, client went to the High Court to seek an injunction to make us proceed. It put us to a huge amount of trouble. Um, I meant, well, we're in Lincoln in the East Midlands. I mentioned that because he went to the High Court in London. We had to arrange for a barrister to represent us. Part of the hearing was heard in private, so the judge did understand our situation. But I just really wanted to share that with you because uh, we were doing, uh, we, nobody suggested for a moment that it was um, an inappropriate SAR, uh, but it put us to a huge amount of trouble. So we weren't put in danger, but we were put to a huge amount of expense, and it involved, you know, people working through the night, etc. <coughs> Yeah. Well, well Crispin, first of all, yeah, yeah. Is that is that just is is that just a cost that you have to absorb? It's part of doing your job properly. So I think that goes back to the earlier question about there's still a contested area about how far we go. You know, the responsibility is clear, but we've got to think through those sorts of issues. Mm. And you know, I think I think that's the first time I've heard that. I'd like to take that away and talk to to to, to Donald and Reno and think what can we do about that? What can we do to make that process smoother so that it doesn't have those sorts of impacts because you know regardless even if it's right or wrong it will put other people off making suspicious activity reports and that's not a good thing certainly from my perspective we should we should have that conversation yeah. I'm, I'm aware of two high court cases 
so far. Um, and I'm just trying to think about where, where the, the solicitor position was in both of those cases. But there's a conversation to be had yeah. there. You know, there is an issue. There is absolutely an issue there. Some of that is about the way the, the system beds itself down effectively. Yeah, okay. But let's talk. All right. I think we had a question, just the gentleman here. I think maybe the solicitors in Derbyshire. I'm the accountant there. UK banks are changing check clearances from February next year. We will have scans on our accounts desks, which will allow us to complete in two working days rather than seven working days. If we get to a completion and tell the client we cannot complete on day two, are we tipping them off? Because the bank are, have got that client on a list that says we cannot complete in two working days. So we have to set our completion dates, allowing for that seven days in case the UK banks say, we can't allow this, this is a suspected <coughs> check, suspected account. Yeah, Donald. It's very, it's very hard to give a simple answer to that. Um, I think, so I'm, a, I'm aware of the issue you're talking about. I know there are, there are, oh, oh, there are conversations ongoing now about what the implications are. Um, but I don't think that we are in a position to say yes or no on the tipping off issue. And I think fundament but I think fundamentally, and there is an issue here about tipping off more generally, that it is very much around the issue around the circumstances of the individual case. I don't think there's not a blanket issue here in either in either direction. Okay. I think we've got time maybe for one more. Uh, the lady sitting in that. <coughs> <coughs> Jane Wilson, Holsmith Whittingham crew. We've been in that situation of making a suspicious activity report on a Friday for a transaction that was due to complete on the Tuesday morning. Thankfully, we got a defence at 4pm on Monday, but theoretically it could have been several weeks, so we would have been in the situation of, um, are we tipping off? Do, does the client lose their very substantial deposit if they don't complete? So not several weeks. In terms of a decision, um, if we're satisfied um, with the, the quality of the Defence Against Money Laundering request in the SAR, then, um, and, and normally on a Defence Against Money Laundering, we are, then um, you'll get an answer within seven working days. Seven working days would have been five days after the day the client was due to complete, mm. and that's a very difficult position to be in. It is. I accept it's a difficult position to be in, and that's why there's, there's an issue which is about the circumstances of individual cases and sometimes the ability to follow up specifically where there is an urgency point with the financial intelligence unit and talk about the, 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 and raise the issue of the individual case. By and large, in the vast majority of transactions, then seven working days is, is not an issue because usually the identified risk is well in advance of that point of completion. Mm. There are as there is in any system, there are exceptions. So it's about then, you know, if you've got an issue, identify it, flag it, say what the problem is, and look for a proper conversation with us. Okay. I'm afraid we're gonna to have to um, call it a day at that point. Can I ask you please to show your appreciation to our panelists? <clears throat>